But joining us now is John Nelms from Final Frontiers Foundation. Welcome to Greenville. Well, thank you very much. You ever been to Greenville before? Oh, been yeah. all over the world. Yeah. But Greenville, <laughs> so you've been here a couple of times. Yeah. I want to thank you for coming tonight. And uh, but Final Foundations, uh, Final Frontiers Foundation is a little bit different than a lot of the traditional uh, mission types organizations. Give us a brief. Uh, history and background of the or the foundation? Well, most missions organizations are founded to send an American overseas. Uh -huh. In 1986, before the term national pastor had been coined yet, we started going around the world seeking for men who were faithful to God in their ministries and starting new churches. And then we kept them in their country and sent money to them to fund them. Wonderful. Because a national preacher can be supported at a ratio of about 100 to 1 of what it takes to send an American missionary. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Um, what's so interesting, you know, I was reading your, your newsletter that uh, we'll be talking about here in a little bit. But in 29, almost 29 years, I guess 1986, the reason I know I was born in 85, so it's <laughs> oh easy. easy. Bragging, I'm, he's I'm, bragging I'm, about I'm young it, now. It? I'm young. So. <laughs> but uh, over almost 1.7 million people have gotten saved. Is that well, right? Well, that's the number we print. It's nowhere near what it really is. Right. But our statistics, um, we only print what we get in in reports. Right, right. Uh, for example, if we support one man, one Paul, let's say, and he uh -huh. has 10 Timothys, we only count what Paul did, exactly. not what Timothys did. It, it's amazing. I, you know, like you said, uh, take the, the 1.7 that you've reached. Now imagine how many that 1.7 has reached. It'd be uh, easily you know? 10 times that much. Exactly. That's oh. exciting, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. It certainly is. Man, man, what made you want to get into the missions field? Well, I was called to missions when I was 11. Yeah. And uh, from that time on, I waited for God to show me where he wanted me to go or what he wanted me to do. Right. In my mind at that time, missions was the traditional going from point A to point B, uh -huh. starting a church, passing that church for the rest of my life. And through Bible study and experience, I began to see in the Word of God that Pastoring a church in a foreign country is not missions. Right. That's just pastoring in a foreign country. Right. That missions is planting churches. Yes. It's what Paul the Apostle did. He was always going from, not from A to B, but from A to B to C to E to F to G. Right. And taking trained men along with him rather than writing back to his home church and asking them for more Jewish missionaries. Uh -huh. I don't think Paul was opposed to it. We had Barnabas and Silas and others. But Paul realized the best one to reach the Greek is another Greek. Right. So he was always trying to reproduce himself in the lives of young men from that local culture. Uh -huh. And then starting the church and turning it over to them and then moving on to start another. Yeah. Well, that's wonderful. And we use his pattern. Yeah. Well, I've heard that, that Paul is, might have went even as far as, you know, China and, and Asia. Yeah, that's just amazing. There's no that, doubt that he went as far as in England. Really? Yes. Wow. That's just phenomenal. And wow. now you've been on every continent except Australia. That's just... Austra in Antarctica. In Antarctica, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 we had a, I was telling him before the show, uh, we had a, a missionary here that uh, tried to get me to Australia now. Uh, Brother Worley, A.S. Worley, he's gone to be with the Lord now. But he said, I've been on every inhabited continent and I don't need to go to Arta Antarctica because the penguins don't need Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> there was no point for him to go, but man, he was a missionary if there was if ever was one. But one thing you said earlier, um, and I asked the pastor that was on with us in the first half the same thing, and what made you want to be a missionary? What made you want to be a pastor? And again, it was a calling. You know, I think everything we do in the ministry is a calling. Uh, so many people want to travel and want to do things, but or maybe even want to pastor. But if they're not called to it, it it's not it's not right. You know, and uh, being a somewhat of a missionary, I've been on missions trips for uh, years now. Um, it really is a calling because it, it can be tough. Uh, we were talking before the program. You went to Bulgaria earlier this year, and uh, you said it took you two weeks to recover from a week-long trip. Yeah, yeah. You know, and uh, there's those that that can go, and then those that can send. And we got right. a lot of faithful viewers that do both, but has supported Dub Broadcast and, and other missionaries throughout the years. And I believe that it's people like that that are just as responsible as the ones that go. Um, but anyway, getting back to to, to uh, Final Frontiers. Um, Tell us about the, the first church that you've planted. You've planted how many thousands now? Uh, well, myself personally, I've only started 15. But the, only 15, <laughs> listen to them. But, the, but through the foundation there. Oh, well, we've started uh, right at 50,000 now. That's on the uh, For the last five years, we've averaged a new church being started every three hours. That's on the A new church for us generally consists of about 30 
newly saved and baptized adult believers. Uh -huh. Now, coming from Georgia, I can stand in my office and throw rocks and hit a number of churches that have been around for 150 years and don't have 30 believers. That's right. Yeah. So we're not talking about just where two or more gather together. Uh -huh. Although the Lord's there, I want to be there with them. That's right. But we're yeah. talking about 30 newly saved adult believers. These are people who turn from witchcraft, turn from paganism, turn from idolatry to worship the true and living God. Yeah. And do it at a risk of their own lives. Well, in so many places, like on the, the front of your progress report, you send these out quarterly. This is in Syria yes, right here. It is. Uh -huh. um, and, of course, we know what things are going on with ISIS there and in the Middle East, and it's getting crazy where Christians are being killed and martyred. Um, this is what they live against every day. I have a friend that pastors in India and uh, just, uh, or excuse me, Pakistan, uh, right near India, um, near the border there. And, uh, you know, he gets threats on a constant basis. Yes. In fact, he sometimes laughs at yeah. it, you know, and uh, finds it comical. But um, these are what he, you know, he travels with armed guards constantly. And uh, this is what they live against. But they do it because they know that Christ is real, don't they? Yes. Tell us some of the situations that you've been in or that some of the pastors go through that you know personally. Well, we do a lot of work in the Middle East. So we've had, in the last four to five years, we've had over 2,000 of our men killed just in Syria. That's unreal. And that doesn't count the, the rest of the countries. But they go through a severe persecution, which really on television I, I couldn't even begin to describe. It would be offensive to people. But yeah. it's more than just... Uh, uh, the old ideas we have about being drawn and quartered or burned at the stake or whatever the case may be. Yeah. Uh, it's it's uh, very emotional. They they see their wives being killed. Uh, sometimes they're, they're told to choose between their wife living or a child. In oh those cases, gen generally, after the husband has made a choice, they kill them all anyway. Yeah. But we see teenagers killed, uh, eyes plucked out, hearts cut open. Um, other things that I couldn't mention. Uh, it, it, it's a horrible, horrible world that's going on around there. We in America know precious little of it. Yeah. We think that what we hear on nightly news is what's going on in the world. And generally what you hear on nightly news is something that, we, that took place a week ago. Right. Or two weeks ago or a month ago or whatever. Right. Well, I've, these are 2,000 people that you have personally touched through Final Frontiers. Yeah, oh yes, uh -huh. And, you know, we hear about a bombing that maybe 50 or so, but I mean, 2,000, well, really, they don't report it constantly. No, we just rescued they? eight of our girls last week from uh, uh, cap capture in Syria who were captured and they were gonna be sold for their body parts. And we were able to, to negotiate their release and we do that on a weekly basis. This is normal for them over there though. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh -huh. That's unreal. Well, on the picture here, it's a man carrying a little boy, a girl. A little girl. Um, Tell us what happened in this picture here. Well, the building had been bombed by government forces. Uh, the Christians are in a position where they're going to be uh, kind of like the guy in the Civil War who wore a Yankee shirt and rebel pants. You know, he, <laughs> he's going to get a bullet from no matter which way he runs. Right. And that's how Christians are. They're persecuted by ISIS. They're persecuted by the government. They're persecuted by the Orthodox Church. Uh -huh. uh, they're persecuted in some cases by, even by those who claim to be evangelical who really are not. Uh -huh. um, they, they'll turn in Christians just to curry favor with the government. Yeah. Now the ones that aren't killed, I see um, here this picture. I don't know if they can zoom in. This is the living conditions for these three children. Are they napping or sleeping? Uh, they were sleeping. One of our pastors saw them and he took them into his home to live with him. Unreal. And there's tens of thousands of orphans in, in uh, Syria now. Yeah. That's unreal. So these children that, that are orphaned, um, how many of them are staying in the church? Or Well, there are no churches, right. per se, no buildings. Churches that are underground churches always meet in a home uh -huh. uh, or an apartment building or, or a place of business. The only churches prior to the war that you had in Syria were Orthodox churches, and their priests were actually employees of the, of the Assad regime. They actually got their sermon delivered to them what oh, they were to preach sure. that Sunday. Wow. Wow. Well, how are these churches found, or the underground churches, how are they found? Somebody tells on them or? Uh, infiltrators, yes. Uh, they actively send infiltrators into a church. We had one of our churches in Iran almost completely wiped out because the pa one of the pastors had taken in a young man who claimed to be a believer, who had lost his family and had no place to live. And he lived with his pastor for three years. 
And at the end of three years, he reported them to the authorities. The pastor was killed within a matter of days. His wife was killed. Wow. Um, we rescued their, their boy so that he wouldn't be raised in a, in a Muslim home. Uh -huh. We had that commitment with our pastor, with all of our pastors, that if you fall, we'll take care of your children. We'll take care of your widows. Uh -huh. And so that, that's a big expense for us, which we can't even go on publicly to raise funds for. It's just something we had to pray the money in. Right. Right. How are you funded? Through people, just uh, donations? Yeah, people, churches and individuals or families that support our ministry or sponsor one of our preachers or one of our children. Yeah. That's how it's done. Well, let's talk about sponsoring the pastors. First off, how do you, how do you choose a pastor to start a church, to, well, to see the church? We, we, we have a qualification process they have to go through. And this is worldwide. It's not just Worldwide, yes. Yeah. First, they have to come recommended to us by a missionary or a national preacher that we know that he's a reliable source. Uh -huh. Then we check out their doctrines, their moral life, their family life, and their ministry experience. If they have not already started at least two churches on their own, mm -hmm. then we don't consider them for support because the Bible warns us against lifting up a novice. You're right. And we don't want to lift up a novice. So mm -hmm. uh, we found it at first we'd say if he's already started one church, he would qualify. And we begin to see a number of men who would start a church and they never start another one. Well, they're not really church planters. Uh -huh. They're a pastor who started a church, right. but that was it. So we've changed our, our requirements now. Do They have to have two churches started and two men in the ministry full-time whom they won to Christ and discipled for the ministry. In other words, we only support men who are fulfilling the Great Commission right. in their own ministry. Right. If they're just pastoring a church or whatever, God bless them. Uh, if they need help, we'll find another organization to help them. Uh -huh. But we're looking for the best of the best of the best. Right. And we're looking for church planters. Yeah. Well, with 50,000 churches worldwide, you got to be doing something right. Well, That's our sure. guys average 1.2 churches a year being started all around That's the world. Wonderful. So in wow. some countries it's more and others it's less. Uh -huh. Well, where, where have you been recently, like this year? Well, I've spent the last three months in Honduras. Okay. Uh, I came back on a Wednesday. And the next day I left for a missions conference in Iowa. <laughs> and then I came back, I think it was last Thursday or Friday or something like that. And then in another week and a half, I'll leave for the Ukraine, Romania, Poland, and Moldova. Okay. And when I come back from there, I'll be here for conferences for a couple of weeks, and then I'll leave to India for a month or a month and a half. <laughs> finish out the year there. Where do you call home? <sighs> Everywhere. Earth. <laughs> I haven't lived out of a dresser in 30 years. <laughs> That's the way to live, brother. I that live sounds exciting. Suitcase, yeah. That sounds exciting. Louisville, Georgia is our home, and it should be pronounced Louisville, uh -huh. but we're dumb hicks. <laughs> well, Louisville, ain't <laughs> we, no more dumb, dumb hicks, better, buddy. So <laughs> I live in Sandy Flats. So I mean, well, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no problem. So I, I, I got that down. So I, I'd rather say Louisville. So I love it. Um, well, uh, I, I got a, a heart for Eastern Europe. I've been to Moldova, Romania, and now Bulgaria for the last four years. Where, where do you find that? you really enjoy being and ministering to. I know the people everywhere is different. I've been to Mexico and then we're talking about Appalachian Mountains. You've been all in Central and yeah. uh, America and South America. But where do you find... Well, really I love Honduras. I, I consider Honduras home. Uh -huh. I'm actually a Honduran resident and I'm working on my citizenship. Now. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. My wife is from Honduras. My daughter-in-law is from Honduras. I lived there for a number of years. Uh, other than that, if I can't be in Honduras, I want to be in India. Really? Uh, because it's the ripest, most fertile ground on the planet that I've seen. Uh -huh. And if I can't be in India, then just spin the globe and stop it anywhere. I don't care. <laughs> no. Well, let's talk about India because we got a billion people in India, a little over a billion people. Um, do, do they exceed China or are they, which ones? Uh, they you know, go back whether you're talking to a Chinaman or, or an Indian. Indian yeah. <laughs> so, but in, I know in the northern part of India, there's a lot of persecution against Christians. Is that in, right? in the northwest along the border of Pakistan. Yeah. The northeast is considered a Christian area of India, although, and they're primarily Baptists, uh -huh. which I heard you say you are, I'm Baptist. Uh -huh. But but a vast majority of them don't know the first thing about the gospel or salvation by grace through faith. They were born a Baptist like somebody else is born a Hindu or a Muslim. Right. So it's still fertile ground for, for uh, soul winning. Yeah. But India is very ripe. India, I'll shock you with something, is my belief that in our generation, certainly in yours, 
India will become a Christian nation. I believe it. In 1992, when I first went there, it was one and a half percent Christian. Wow. Uh, in 2011, the government said it was 13 and a half percent. Wow. Yeah. Now that's a 12 percent growth, but that's 12 percent of a billion of people. Of a billion, right. exactly. That's a lot of people. Yeah. yeah. But church leaders in India estimate that it's probably more like 20 to 23 percent Christian wow. right now. Yeah. So if we win India to Christ, India will win the rest of the world. Exactly. Man, that is phenomenal. That is phenomenal. It really is. Wow. And under that persecution, for them to confess Christ and to live for Christ is different than, you know, I hear statistics in the United States that we're 80-something percent Christian, but I, again, yeah. I think that's... We're born. We're they're, they're born thinking. Christian. Yeah. And, that's the, that's, and you know what I mean by that, being facetious, but uh -huh. these are people that, uh, that to say you're a Christian publicly is, it, a, yes. is we, a heavy statement. We've had exactly. wives who got saved in a Sunday morning service, went to the river and were baptized, and before the Sunday night service, their husband had beat them to death. Oh my wow. goodness. Or set them on fire and burned them because she had shamed their family by becoming a Christian. Oh so it, it goes on all the time. You just don't hear about it. Yeah. Well, if they uh, subscribe to the Progress Report. And it's free. They the will hear about that. So yes. we're going to go to a song. But real quick, you can go to finalfrontiers.org and subscribe to this. And when we come back, we're going to be talking to John some more. Um, but right now, let's go to Forrest and Phillips, take a break. Uh, and... Uh, they're doing a wonderful song, Mercy Walked In. I want to encourage you to continue to go to the phones. Um, Such so an exciting day today. You know, Sean here at Anderson has given his heart to the Lord this morning. Wonderful. Hour. Isn't that great? God. And yeah. uh, here's a, pra a praise report I want to read over real quick. Robert he, uh, Brown, he's a World War II veteran. He's 91 today. Wow. Thank you, God, for that. So thank you for your service, too, Robert. Yes. And I uh, just got an email prayer request from a lady in Travel's Rest. Please, uh, please pray God will find a way where I see no way in my financial solution. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's what uh, he's, God is the way. He's the only way. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And uh, we're going to pray over all these prayer requests here in a little bit, including the ones that get emailed. And like I said, I get those day and night. So keep emailing me uh, your prayer requests. I want to hear from you for sure. But we're going to continue our conversation with John uh, Nelms from Final Frontiers Foundation. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we've been talking a lot about uh, Syria and uh, a lot of the persecution going on in India. And, um, you've shared some encouraging words from India, but when you said, you know, 12% of what the official report says, that's like 120 million yeah. people. Mm -hmm. You yes. know, that's uh, almost half the population of the United States. So that's that's exciting, especially in a, uh, such a uh, you know area like India. Tell us, how do you begin to minister to somebody that might be a Hindu or a Muslim their entire life? Well, <clears throat> well, it would be different whether it's a Hindu or Muslim or whatever it All is, right. but what I generally do is I use their culture. Uh -huh. uh, most everybody considers America to be a Western religion. And so I start off by trying to show them that it's not a Western religion at all. For example, when I'm in India, I'll remind them that, that the, the clothes that their women wear that they're known for, what we call saris, uh -huh. were actually Greek clothing. That They adopted that from Alexander the Great wow. with the women that followed his camp, so to speak. That the buildings they make, they built are made out of concrete where the Romans invented that. The shirts they wear are made out of cotton, but the Egyptians cultivated cotton first. Right. So I, the point is that you use a lot of things from other cultures, but you make it yours. Uh -huh. And the gospel is not an American religion. We made it ours. Right. That the gospel right. came to India 2,000 years ago. It right. came to America 200 exactly. years ago. Yeah. So we're just reminding you of what was already brought to us after it was brought to you. Yeah. And then, then they begin to accept it more. They want, want to know more about it because they think, if it came here 2,000 years ago, why haven't I heard about uh -huh. it? And that's where Romans 1 comes in. Uh, their priests, just like the leadership in the time of Christ, they knew God. They knew Him. Uh -huh but they did not glorify him as God. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Right. They begin to worship the created thing instead of the creature. Uh -huh. And for that reason, God gave them up. They eventually even lost the knowledge of who God is. Uh -huh. And the word Brahma, which we think of as a cow, in the Hindu language, Sanskrit language, Brahma was the name for the supreme God who created the world and the sun and the moon and the stars. He had a son named Prajapati. His son was offered up as it would be offered up as a sacrifice for mankind. Uh -huh. He would wear a crown of thorns. He would be nailed to a cross. This is sound he would, familiar. He would have a spear stuck in his side. 
There's 17 things written in the Rig Veda, the oldest holy book of the, of the Hindus. 17 things that parallel with the life of Jesus Christ. Uh -huh. So I've got two friends in India who are preachers now who used to be Brahmin priests. Uh -huh. They got saved when somebody gave them a gospel of John, and as they began to read it, they, they realized this Jesus is the Prajapati that our faith prophesied would come someday. Wow. So they put their faith and trust in him. Wow. With Muslims, you don't attack their faith. You, Muslims believe in Jesus. Right. They believe in the rapture. Uh -huh. They believe Jesus is coming back again. Only they're gonna, they believe that he won't come to Jerusalem. He'll come to the Ahmad Mosque in Damascus. Uh -huh. In the northwest corner of the mosque, there's a closet. They believe Jesus and Muhammad are going to walk out of that. That's the same mosque that the Apostle Paul preached in right after getting saved. Wow. And between wow. where he stood and the closet that they're going to come out of, they believe, there's a shrine that has the head of John the Baptist in it. They still live what we read as history. Uh -huh. They live it as if it happened yesterday. Wow. wow. So one, they respect David. They respect Solomon. They respect Moses. They see all these as prophets of God. Uh -huh. If Jesus could win people to Christ by only using the writings of the prophets, so can we. Yeah, exactly. And they, then they begin to see him as more than just a prophet, they see him as the son of God. Yeah. By the way, 150 years ago, every Quran written stated that Jesus was the virgin-born son of God. Really? They took it out of their Quran about 150 years ago. Okay, why would they do that? Though? I have no idea. Hmm. Wow, I've never heard that That's interesting. Before. That yeah. is. Wow. Well, now it makes sense. You know, it's always made sense to me. Your, your philosophy is getting the local people to be the missionary, mm -hmm. if you want to call it that, um, in their own country because they can mm -hmm. relate to those cultures. And teach them from their own culture. I believe that God has given a glimpse of himself to every culture. Yeah. Now we have to help them find where is that glimpse. Now let's shine a little bit more light on it right. so that the glory of the gospel shines through. Right. And that's what missions work really is, is going out to those people who've never been exposed to the gospel and shining the light of the gospel on them. If you've lived in nothing but darkness all your life, how can you reject light? Right, right. exactly. You can't reject right. it. Well, I always say, you know, light shines brighter in the darkest room. Absolutely. Know? And, uh, man, it's just exciting what you're doing. Now, you got other things going on. Oh, tell us about the, uh, the other pictures you brought well, with us. Well, uh, we ask people to sponsor uh, preachers or children in our ministry. We ask for $50 a month for a preacher. Now, most Americans are going to get five, six, seven, eight thousand dollars $8,000 a month. Right. We ask for $50 a month. This particular one is a family from Togo, West Africa. 80% of the African Americans in the United States came from West Africa. Wow. 80% wow. of them. So this is somebody's cousin. All right. Maybe right. somebody who's watching right now. That's right. That's their cousin. He's a preacher, winning people to Christ, planting churches, training men for the ministry. Wow. And we ask people to sponsor him. Then we have a children's ministry, which is very much like compassion or a world vision, uh -huh. except we, we run ours through a local church. Uh, and that way people can sponsor a child. It takes care of their education, their food, uh, clothing, uh, uh, educational needs, that sort of thing. And we ask for $35 a month oh, to sponsor a child. Deal. Now, the children are going to write to you twice or six times a year. Wow. We take missions to groups where people can go and visit can, the kid that they support. Wonderful. Preachers will write to you, I think it's four times a year, wonderful. thanking you, telling you what they've accomplished because of the support that you've given them. Uh -huh. So. It's a real blessing. Wonderful. Real blessing. Now, if there's somebody watching tonight that might not be from the U.S., they're here, just, and they want to go back to their home country and start a church, or how do you get involved? Of course, to be a part of the, the Final Frontier, you've got to plant two churches, and mm -hmm. you know, you got your, your prerequisites there. But how can they get involved, maybe, it's to support these churches that's already there? In their, their country. Well, if they want to get in touch with us, uh, we'll do a background check on them first <laughs> to see who they really are. Yeah. Uh, and then we'll, we can put them in touch with believers in other countries. Awesome, awesome. Pastor, this is pretty exciting, isn't it? It is, yeah. I'm just listening. And, and you know, I, I'm thinking of your heart and your philosophy uh, with using the indigenous people. That's a big $200 word to say what you're saying, the, <laughs> the people that are, that are from there. But... I think of my own experience. First mission trip I ever took was in the mid-90s, and I went to Panama. It's still my favorite place in the world because that's the first place I visited. And I remember I was so impacted by that trip. I was pastoring a church. I'd only been pastoring a, a short time. And uh, I was there with another group of ministers. My family was not with me. 
And the last night before I flew back, I was ready to send for my family and just yeah. become a missionary to Panama. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it's the only mission trip I'd ever taken. I'd just, when the missionaries would come through our church, I'd give a donation and feel good about it. But it impacted my life in such a way I was ready to commit my life to, to missions. And I really sensed the Holy Spirit speaking to my heart that I could do more for missions. Me, I'm speaking as my own situation. I could do more mm -hmm. by returning to my church, casting the vision, sharing my experience, and helping raise the funds. And now over the last uh, 20, 20 plus years, God has allowed us to raise, you know, I couldn't even begin to guess how much we've been able to raise mm -hmm. to support missions around the world. And so we've all got a role to play. Now I've been yeah. back, I've, I've traveled on trips and sh preached in crusades and different campaigns that we've done and supported missionaries. But you said it earlier, for some they're called to go, for some they're called to sin. But exactly. whatever way that God can use you. Yes. Uh, it, I couldn't learn. It would have taken me, I, I've been trying for 25 years to learn the language of Spanish. <laughs> and I've picked up enough to find the bathroom and get something to eat. You know, you that's, that's about as far as I've come along. But... Uh, but I thought, you know, it, it would take me years to even be able to communicate uh -huh. effectively to individuals. Mm -hmm. But I could support the ministry that's there and strengthen them. And that's what you're doing on a yeah. very large basis. And so yeah. I admire that and, uh, and just uh, thank God for, for what you're doing. It's amazing. Yes. Absolutely amazing. Yeah. Uh, one thing we didn't talk about, and that was the, the criminal element of here. The Bible smuggling, you know, breaking the law in many of these yeah. countries. Tell us about that. How how you smuggle in Bibles in some of these countries and get them through. That's just fascinating. Can we talk about that? No. <laughs> You're hesitant. <laughs> we won't mention the country. In the, but... in the broadest strokes, we can. <laughs> so we'll, let's do it in broad strokes. These countries that it's illegal to, to even possess a Bible. These people are hungry and there for the word. Yeah. And you know they've got to get it. How many? I've heard it before, and you might know the number. How many uh, languages are there now? And I think the Bible's published in just about every language there is on earth, if not all the languages. No, it's, it's, it's not. not. No, it's, it's not. It's, it's a, probably a thousand or more that has doesn't have a complete Bible, and many languages don't have any of it. Really? But languages are dying. Every every two weeks, a language dies. Really? Wow. Yeah, it's getting to the Right now, 96% of the people in the world speak one of four languages. Uh -huh. In America, we're, we only speak one. Uh -huh. But in most of the world, they're going to speak two, four, sure. eight right. languages. Right. So right. if you know Ameri or English or Arabic, Spanish or Mandarin or Cantonese, whichever one it is, uh -huh. Chinese, uh -huh. uh, then you can communicate with 96% of the people on the planet. That's unreal. Well, going back to you saying you're trying to learn the language, I decided I would try to learn Bulgarian oh. and forget about it. And then I found out there's 7 million people lives in Bulgaria, I believe. Well, there's only 12 million people on the planet that speaks Bulgarian right. as their, their first language. And I was like, all right, I need to learn Spanish. When, <laughs> I, was, when I was there because be of the Celtic effective. letters and that kind of thing, you know, it's not like Spanish where you can figure out yeah, what it's saying. Yeah, they got Cyrillic and, with threes uh, so and spiders in there. I finally found a translation app on my phone. I, I, I gave up trying to, <laughs> I would just speak and it would translate and I would show yeah. them what I was needing. But yeah, it's, uh, but yet, uh, you know, your philosophy of ministry is, is just so effective. And that's the reason I think you're seeing the results you're seeing. Yeah. Right? Very powerful, and people coming to Christ. If you're talking about a church being planted every, what did you say, three and a half three hours? Every three hours. Uh, imagine the people that are coming to Christ. Yeah, there's no way. To, there's no way to calculate yeah, that. That's just an hour ministry. Doing. Sure, and we're and y'all never heard of us. Yeah, you said we're the thirteenth largest missions organization in America. Yeah, we're the second largest Baptist missions organization in America. And nobody's ever That's heard of unreal. us. That's unreal. Only the Southern Baptist Mission Board is bigger than we are. Wow. Uh, so it's, but you know what? How do you how do you do this and nobody knows who you are? Right. It's all good. And you're not doing it with money. Yeah. You're doing it with the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. yeah. When Jesus, you quoted, I think it was you quoted Acts one eight. Uh -huh. Yeah. He told them to go out with the power, but shortly before that, he made this statement: "All power has been given to me." Right. That's right. Everywhere. So go into all the world and preach the gospel. Yeah. So the power that created the universe was given to Jesus, and then he handed it to us. Absolutely. So we have no excuse for not reaching the gospel or reaching the world. Our motivating vision is this, that in our lifetime we will see the Great Commission uh -huh. accomplished. Yes. And I believe, I believe with all my heart we will. And the way it's going today, it will be done. Well, like you said, what y'all are doing, just through the, the pause, like you said, 
One point, almost 1.7 million have been reached in 29 yeah. years, and that's not counting the ones that they've reached out. I mean, well, in the last 10 phenomenal. years, they estimate that there have been 300 million people come to Christ. That's unreal. 10 million of those were in the United States, Canada, and Europe. 290 million of them were in the third world. Wow. We think we are the center of Christianity. Yeah. And tragically, the rest of the world looks to America because we've got the studios and the radio stations and the bookstores and everything else. Uh -huh. But if they look at us too long, they're going to wither in apathy. They're that's going to dry right. on the vine because that's what our churches in America are doing. Yeah. You know, yeah. we, we talk about church planting in America. We don't plant churches in America. We shift church members right. in America. Right. Yeah. But when we say church planting, we're talking about going into a village that's never heard the gospel. Uh -huh. There's not a light bulb there. There's not a water faucet there. They've never seen a, a well, they've never seen anything. They've right. never seen a truck, a car, right. anything. Preaching Christ to them and staying a day, a week, a month, however long you have to, do you have a nucleus of believers. Leave a pastor with them, and then you take on over the mountain to the next village. Yeah. That's how we plant churches. What can our viewers do to help? Do you all need donations? Do you need Bibles in different languages? What do you all need the most? Prayer. We do need funds. Uh, well, so we'd ask people to pray about funds. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we need, there, there's got to be a million preachers like this around the world who are struggling. They don't have food to feed their kids at night when they go to bed. They may eat 300 calories a day if they're fortunate. Yet they're pastoring three or four churches and working full time. Mm -hmm. If we can just give them $50, $100, $150 a month, they can quit the coffee plantation, come out of the rice paddies, mm -hmm. quit driving a taxi in, in Bangkok or whatever, and be full time in the ministry. Yeah. If a man can pastor three churches part time, what can he do full time? Amen. Wow. And all it takes from us is what we would leave as a tip right. for a waitress this Sunday after church. Right. right. That's all it takes. Wonderful. Well, um, the website is finalfrontiers.org. Um, can we get, there it is on the screen right there. And if anything, you need to go on there and subscribe to the free it's, quarterly, yes, it's quarterly uh, and free. Newspaper or uh, news report, uh, the progress report. And uh, uh, just, I, I look forward to reading this. I was reading it trying to, uh, before the show. And just what y'all are doing all over the world is just phenomenal. Um, how many countries are you in? Uh, 86. 86 countries. That is amazing. That is just wonderful. So, well, where's next for you? I know you said earlier. Where uh, are you going? Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe. That's right. Yeah, going to Moldova and Ukraine and Romania and all over the place over there. So, yeah. man, that's phenomenal. Well, uh, we we wish you luck. We're going to be praying so for you for sure. Sure, appreciate and, it. And uh, we you, got man. to remember yes, all these pastors in the Middle East. Man, that was just so. Uh, that's on my heart here lately. And uh, I might not ever get to visit the Middle East, and that's fine. But I will send my prayers over there because what they're going through. It's just unreal for the name of Jesus Christ. Um, you know, it's things that we read about and that, that we see on the news sometimes. But like you shared with us tonight, there's so much more that's going on that we don't hear about. And uh, it's just phenomenal um, what they do for, the, for that word, to keep that word going. So keep those pastors in your prayer and all the Christians around the world. Yes. I mean, they're, they're just being persecuted left and right. So.